It's officially debate season, and tonight we're starting with the top Democrats running for governor. And yes, the gloves came off. With all due respect, you haven't been doing the work at all. How's, how's it going? We're also keeping track of every time a candidate dodges a question. Do you disagree with the vast majority of voters that we are on the wrong track? I agree that people are angry and frustrated. Here's the story. I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. Congratulations on making it to Friday. I just decided about an hour ago, casual Friday. All the ways to communicate with us right there at the bottom of your screen. You can email us. The address is thestory at kgw.com. You can use the hashtag thestorykgw on Twitter or leave us a voicemail. Just call our phone number 503-226-5090. Hey, let's start off by talking about President Biden's visit to the Northwest and more specifically, our media coverage of it, and if we drill down even more, KGW's coverage of it. This is a unique show where we get to break the mold of traditional local news, so let's break it again and talk about what you saw during our day of coverage, because some of you didn't like it too much, and I'm here to tell you why you are wrong. But before we argue, let's have a refresher. We tracked the president's plane as it flew into Portland Airport, and showed the president meeting and greeting Oregon's leading politicians. We also carried President Biden's speech live. We told you how much he cares about infrastructure and how the federal government will help upgrade a runway at Portland's International Airport. On this show, I suggested that his visit was good for the Democratic Party and good for the president himself, but really made no difference to the rest of us. Some of you took me to task for that, saying any notice from a president is important regardless of whether there are specific things he decides to do for our state because of the fact that he was here. Terry, for example, wrote, in our opinion, your story regarding President Biden's visit was negative and wrong because you dismissed it as not being of any value. Well, thanks, Terry. That's fair enough. I guess that's a philosophical battle that I'm open to the potential that I'm wrong on that point, although I really don't think so. But I take your point. What really fired many of you up, though, was our coverage earlier in the day during other newscasts when we added context to the president's visit. We got several emails like this one from Bruce, which reads, made multiple points about low poll ratings and Republicans negative comments. It was unnecessary and inappropriate. Well, we did mention President Biden's low approval numbers in national polls. Some of you may not like it, but it's a fact. I mean, here's the latest from Gallup. This report out today, just today, shows President Biden's approval rating is 41.3 percent. They have another chart that shows that Biden's rating for this time in his presidency is the second lowest going back to President Eisenhower. The only other president with a lower approval rating from voters at this time in their presidency, Donald Trump. So don't get mad at a news organization for reporting a fact on the president. Actually, I think you should get mad when news organizations don't give you context. You should question not just what you're seeing, but also what is not being reported. We question things here all the time. You should too. I know some of you think that there's some sort of conspiracy amongst the media to keep repeating the president's low approval numbers as a way to push them down farther. That's just a bunch of nonsense. We also pointed out during our coverage that inflation is a growing concern for many. In a report out this month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported the consumer price index is up 8.5% for the last 12 months. That is the biggest jump since December of 1981. Now, you can not like that fact, but it does not change that it is a fact. Others of you took us to task for reporting the Republican take on the president's visit. Chris wrote in, cover what he did. We do not care about what the Republicans had to say about it. So here's the thing. When we tell you that we're an independent local TV news station, we really mean it. We're not here to support the Democrats or the Republicans or any other political group. We are here to give you, the viewer, the unvarnished truth as best as we can figure it out. That often means adding context to what's happening and not just pointing our cameras at an event and letting it speak for itself. I gotta tell you, I have covered several presidential visits to Oregon over the last three decades, both Democrats and Republicans. They are always one-sided, tightly controlled trips that show the best side of whatever the president and the handlers want you to see. Adding context means reminding you of the backdrop for the event, the other factors at play that you cannot see from just looking at the screen. Simply parroting the talking points that either party would feed us? Well, that's called public relations. That's not journalism, and that's not what we do. 
And by the way, we're not going to change. I'm sorry if you don't like it, but it, do yourself a favor. If it leaves you constantly shouting at the screen, this may not be the news station for you. You can always change the channel. That's my opinion. You don't have to agree, but I would love to hear you, your take on it. Send me a voicemail, send me an email. The email address is the story at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail. The number is 503 226 5090. Let's stick to the politics beat now for our big story because the primary election is just a few weeks away, and that means the gloves are coming off with the top politicians. It is debate time. We held our first debate today with the Portland City Club. They chose the Democratic front runners, former House Speaker Tina Kotek and State Treasurer Tobias Reed. The City Club had their own criteria for choosing the candidates. It was our job to ask the questions. First, we want to focus on the candidates' answers to the subject they and we hear most often about, the homeless crisis. Would you take a more assertive approach into tent camping? A lot of people uh, want to see that uh, happen to move people into shelters. Would you be more assertive in moving tent camping off the streets? I think we have to be more assertive in the overall approach. But when it comes to having folks move into shelters, we need more homeless navigators on the street. It's in my plan to help people have that connection and trusting relationship to get people into shelter so they can move into permanency. That will take time, but it will also take more people on the streets doing that work. Um, and uh, right now, it's, you can't move people unless there are more shelter and more transitional options. We have to create those. And I am so frustrated with the speed at which the city is doing this work, and we can do it differently. Would you support a more assertive approach to tent camping and require people to move off the streets and into shelters? Got a quick, quick answer there. We have to make sure that there are those uh, available transitional uh, shelters and, and opportunities. But once we're there, yes, I think it is it is OK to say you have responsibilities to the other parts of, of community as well. And if you're governor, would you support the state helping to pay for those shelters? I think we have resources at the state level that we have to look at effective investments in. That's going to make it so much more possible uh, in the rest of the state. And it's not just the Portland problem, by the way, either. Uh, but yes, I think we have to look at all options. Now, the biggest fireworks of the day happened when the candidates were talking about creating housing in Oregon. Reed said he is involved in creating housing as treasurer by issuing state bonds. But Kotek said she's really the only one who's worked on the issue and that she just talked to the president about it. I would just say a little bit malarkey to that about what you have been doing. You haven't been in the arena working on this issue, Tobias. You just simply haven't. And if you, the people who are endorsing me and supporting me, I race are the folks who have done housing, housing development, shelter work. And with all due respect, you haven't been doing the work at all. Tobias? How's, how's it going? I think he, he's asking how, how, how is the homeless crisis going? Yes, how is housing people going? I think going? the question was well, how is it going to you? But governor, Tobias, it is not working. Because as governor, the only way to change that is be to charge of the agencies and have the, the authority to get local government leaders to work differently together. And you know that. So here's the interesting thing about that. You were the most if powerful governor or powerful legislator uh, in Oregon. You could summon those directors to your office at a moment's notice. Every budget uh, is a reflection of your decisions. Who has gavels in the house? Who, uh, what the agendas are in those committees are a reflection of your direction. So to now say that you could only do, that you were a lowly legislator without the effective ability to, to deal with that, I don't. I, don't I actually didn't say that, Tobias. What I said was, I frankly, that's a simplistic answer. There, I created housing committees. I created significant investments over the top of everyone. The Senate President is notorious for saying, every time she came to my office, she wanted more money for housing and homelessness. And I'm running for governor because with those investments and with the new laws on the books, we should be doing better. And that is an indictment of the state's inability to work with local leaders to make sure those investments are actually producing outcomes. And I'm tired of it. That's why I'm running for governor. 
The two candidates actually share similar views on many issues, but Reid is positioning himself as the more moderate Democrat and the outsider who has experience in taking big ideas and actually making them happen. Tina Kotek is positioning herself as someone who knows the state's biggest problems and has already worked to pass legislation to help solve them, that she's in touch with the voters' ideals and knows how to drive the state's ship to a better future. By the way, you should watch the entire debate yourself. We have it posted on the KGW YouTube page, and we'll have much more next week on Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. One of the fun parts of debate season for me, I have to say, is watching closely to see who's actually answering these questions and who's not. Politicians love to change questions they don't like. It's sort of like they kind of forget the actual question and instead they answer something that they do like. It's called a pivot. It's different than a flip-flop where someone changes their mind. Here they're sort of changing the question, kind of bending it so that they can say what they really want. We did see an example of that today during the debate. First, here's the question. Do you disagree with the vast majority of voters that we are on the wrong track and why or why not? Tina, you'll go first here. Okay, so there you have the question. Is the state on the wrong track? Do you agree with voters that it's on the wrong track? Listen closely to this answer from Tina Kotek. Well, I agree that people are angry and frustrated and I share that frustration. Look, we have been through some very difficult years with the, with the pandemic and you know it's not completely over. It's understandable people are hurting, they're frustrated, their lives have been upended and they're looking for someone to say, where do we go next? So I'm not surprised by those numbers, but I'm running for governor because I am hopeful. And I found this when I was talking to Oregonians in other parts of the state outside the metro area, but also in the metro area. People want to solve problems. They love Oregon. They want Oregon to be successful. So the question was, do you agree with voters that the state's on the wrong track? Everyone knows that you are frustrated, that everyone knows the voters are frustrated. The interesting thing in that question is, do the candidates agree the state is on the wrong track. Now, it might be a tough question for Tina Kotek because she's been part of the leadership until recently. And if she says yes, then it might seem like she's partly to blame. But ignoring the specific question, Kotek answered that people are frustrated and want to solve problems. She did not answer that question. But before we give our award, let's see how Tobias Reed did with the same question. Does he agree with voters that Oregon is on the wrong track? I agree with the, the sentiment that's expressed in that poll. Uh, I don't think we have been on, on the right track for a while. OK, so there you have it. To be fair, probably a lot easier for him to say yes, but he did answer it directly. He agrees the state is not on the right track. Tina Kotek made a pivot and answered the question she wanted to answer. And for that, we are so proud to award Tina Kotek our pivot of the day. Congratulations. By the way, this is the second pivot of the day award for Tina Kotek. And before you hit send on your angry emails, we're not just having fun with the Democrats. The Republicans do the same thing. They're going to hold their debate on May 3rd. We expect to give them the exact same treatment. It's a story we've been following for years, even before the pandemic. Raise your hand if you believe classroom disruptions are at a crisis level. Everybody. Students acting out at school, sometimes violently. Um, I'm talking like profanity, um, hitting, kicking, um, throwing chairs, tipping tables. Now teachers in Salem say they need help. There's no, there's no solution. There's no, there's no end in sight to this. When the story continues. Welcome back. Please keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. I've seen a lot of emails come in, so we obviously hit a nerve there off the top. Thank you for communicating with us. You can also give us a call, leave a voicemail at 503-226-5090. We really do want to hear from you. Earlier in the show, I talked about our role as journalists in the face of some criticism of our coverage of President Biden's visit to Portland this week. On Straight Talk this week, Laurel Porter spoke with Ann Curry about that same topic. You probably recognize Curry from the Today Show. She was also a report, reporter at KGW in the early 1980s. She was recently back in the Pacific Northwest to accept the Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award in Broadcast Journalism from Washington State University. That is a huge deal. Laurel sat down with her to talk about trust in journalism. But I think because of the technological revolution and its devastation on journalism, 
murdering thousands of newspapers in the last 15 years, local newspapers which have been the glue for trust in our communities. And it is a, I believe there's a direct link between the dramatic increase in mistrust in journalism and the, and the death of these local newspapers and the pressure on local television and national television and national newspapers and national magazines to, to, to become more um, bombastic, to become less thoughtful, uh, to take less time to sort of look at how to make sure that they're striving to get, uh, to fulfill their mandate, the mandate of accuracy and independence and accountability and humanity and yes, fairness, with an eye always to the truth as your North Star. There was a, a, a great bit of advice from an, from an old journalist, his nickname was Spud, I was a young kid, brand new out of college reporting, and one time I was working with a bunch of other reporters, including Spud, on a story. We all stopped to have a, a beer, and so I'm having a beer with these older reporters, and Spud said, looked at me, he goes, Curry, let me give you a piece of advice. Don't trust anyone. I said, don't trust anyone? He says, no, I don't trust anyone. Everybody wants to tell you the story as they want it told. Don't even trust your mother. I said, don't trust my mother? He said, no, even she has an ax to grind. <laughs> and then he said, you know what? Don't even trust yourself. Which I thought was the most important line. We all come forward with biases. We all want to believe. We all feel more comfortable with certain kinds of stories. And that's why journalists, that's the job of journalists that people don't get. Our job is to try to go past our are, to work in that painful way, to remove, think through it so that we can open up our own blinders past our biases, to try to keep looking, keep looking, you know, just insisting, asking, 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 looking, looking, looking. Some great wisdom right there. You can watch Laurel's full interview with Ann Curry on Straight Talk. That's tonight at 7 o'clock on KGW. We'll be right back. You may have heard that some schools are more violent these days. It's true. In some areas, it's so bad that teachers are leaving. Christine Pitawanich takes us to the Salem-Kaiser School District. It's been a difficult story to tell, mostly because often teachers don't feel like they can talk about their experiences because of potential repercussions. We had a chance to speak to Salem-Kaiser educators, both former and current, about their concerns around school violence that they say is happening far too often. We also want to warn you that some images may be disturbing. Taylor Woosley knows very well that being a teacher during the pandemic has been stressful. This school year was her first year teaching special education in Salem-Kaiser Public Schools. She wanted to do it after being an instructional assistant. I just want to do, make more of a difference. But within a week, Woosley, who was pregnant at the time, found herself facing scary situations involving her third, fourth, and fifth graders in special ed. I was getting threatened by students. Um, I'm going to hit you and I don't care if your baby dies. I mean, um, I'm talking like profanity, um, hitting, kicking, um, throwing chairs, tipping tables. These photos, examples of what educators have seen and endured. There was zero education going on, zero. She says she and other educators were getting attacked. Last year, I got a concussion. Every single one of my um, IAs have received concussions. They've, they've received um, from, from students, and there was nothing that we could do. After a month and a half on the job, Woosley decided to leave. I, I went to basically almost everybody, it felt like, except for the superintendent, <laughs> and nothing was changing. I am Danielle Hardin. I am a fourth grade teacher in the Salem-Kaiser District. Uh, this is my first full year teaching. Danielle Hardin has also pretty much made up her mind. She's leaving at the end of the year. My classroom has been destroyed multiple times. She says students in her general education class have assaulted her twice. I morally cannot stay in this if something doesn't change because I feel like it's displaying to students that I have to stay in abuse. 
Hardin says she and her family had for years considered moving. Now the stress has helped solidify her decision. I feel like teachers and parents alike have had enough. I'm afraid not only is the staff going to get hurt, I'm afraid our kids are going to get hurt worse. Mom, Jamie Scott, says the fights at school have prompted a change for her daughter. Um, I've already pulled her for next year. She will not be going to Salem-Kaiser School in person ever again. One of my daughter's friends, who's a freshman, was walking down the hallway and another student just punched him, broke his nose, sent him to the hospital. Scott says the fights are then posted to social media. She showed us an Instagram page dedicated to displaying them. Um, one kid's yelling at another kid. So they're arguing back and forth. I'm shaking just watching those two videos. Something has to change. That was the sentiment at Waldo Middle School, where nearly all licensed staff signed this letter to the superintendent, asking for more counselors, behavioral specialists, and school security officers, as well as consequences for students who misbehave. You know, I think our response is first to, to acknowledge um, where our, our staff are coming from, and then to ask how we can help. That's Ethan Udosinata, Salem Kaiser's assistant superintendent. He says while they're seeing more physical and aggressive behavior this year, in prior years, behavioral issues seemed to spike at certain times. For instance, before winter break or spring break. That was the case this year as well. We, in partnership with our teachers association, went and did some visits at Waldo so that we can assess um, together what the climate was like in the school. Udosinata says at schools like Waldo, where there seem to be more disruptive behaviors, the district increases security presence, not through the use of school resource officers, but through school security specialists who walk the halls unarmed. We have maybe two or three or maybe even five um, uh, school security specialists that we can spread out throughout the school, which really does uh, increase the, the security presence. Um, more than a singular um, SRO or school resource officer being present on campus. And Udosinata also says there are consequences for kids who misbehave. There have been roughly 5,000 suspensions in the district. That's a number that's down from previous years, despite the heightened level of behavior. We're putting a lot of other strategies um, in place that I think deserve credit for the reduction of suspensions. Meantime, Taylor Woosley will pay for her decision to leave. A district program covered the cost for her to become a special education teacher and requires she work in the district for at least three years. I decided that I would rather pay my uh, schooling, um, which was over $6,000, and leave. Um, I was fortunate enough to get hired at a smaller district um, where I took an $11,000 pay cut. Woosley is willing to sacrifice that money, but she's worried about the students. I'm terrified of what this whole next generation is going to look like if we continue down this road as educators. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. When we come back, a way you can make a difference in the Northwest. For this week's Hey Help campaign, we're asking you to donate to Native Action Network. It's a nonprofit based in Seattle that helps Native American women get involved in politics and run for office at local, state, and national levels. If you'd like to donate, you could just hold your phone's camera up right now to that QR code on your screen. Or you can always go to kgw.com slash heyhelp. That's the end of our program. Thanks so much for being here and watching. And remember, the story, our story, that never ends. I'll see you on Monday.